Good morning, Emmanuel. Happy Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. What a blessing, what a blessing. Uh, as Solomon said, truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is to behold the sun, a pleasant thing to be alive. I thank God for every one of you and for all of our uh, friends and neighbors and uh, guests who are visiting with us today as we worship. I want to thank our choir for that beautiful selection. Uh, truly, he deserves it, brothers and sisters. He deserves our praise, our love, our faith, our obedience, our everything, because he deserves us. He has bought us. He has redeemed us and redeemed that we should be sons and daughters of God. So we have much to rejoice in today. So as we get into God's word today, and it's going to be more a study than a sermon, I want to invite you to get your Bible. And we're going to really be studying the subject of worship. Worship, because that is the central issue of the Bible. And so let us turn to, again, Revelation chapter 14. And this is sort of the climax of worship, the great issue in the last days. Um, Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. And I will read them in your hearing. And it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, reverence him and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Let us pray. Loving God, our Father, as we Today, go into your word in this worship service. We need you. We need your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to illuminate our minds that the light of your glory may indeed shine upon us and within us. Bind the enemy and distractions and confusion and make your word sweet and precious in our sight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Because the Bible is about God from Genesis to Revelation, and it's about Christ who is God from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is about life because Christ is our life. And it begins with God's creation, giving us the reason for worshiping him and giving us a clear picture of who he is and it tells us very early on in the creation account in the book of Genesis that we are the crown of his creation, made in his image. Humanity, therefore, that's us, the image of God created in us, made in us. But that image well now defiled because of the disobedience, because of the unbelief, the lack of trust, the lack of love the questioning, the doubting, the evil surmising that the enemy was able to uh, influence and to implant in the mind of Adam and Eve. And the question, as Adam and Eve were on probation, was really about worship. Would Adam and Eve worship God? Now, the Bible tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. All of his creation testifies to the reality that he is God. In the book of Isaiah, the scripture tells us that uh, the ox knows his master and the ass knows his crib, and they both know who feeds them. But the question in the Bible again is, what about us as human beings? Do we know God? And are we prepared to worship him? Again, the scripture tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork, but what about us? The question, the recurring question, the sacred theme of sacred history, the personal challenge to us today is, are we worshiping 
God. This has been a conflict throughout history. It's been a conflict because nations and governments have at times compelled people to worship human beings, to worship ideologies instead of worshiping God. In John chapter four, as Jesus walked upon this earth and he encountered the Samaritan woman at the well, in John chapter four, verse 23, Jesus said, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Brothers and sisters, this tells us that there are also false worshipers and there are true worshipers. And we want to worship the Lord, as the scripture tells us, in spirit and in truth. Throughout the Psalms, the psalmist testifies to the goodness of God, to the reason why we should worship him. In Psalm 29 and verse two, he says, ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. So there's a beauty that's attached to worship. And yet brothers and sisters, we know that there's also the blood that is a central part of worship. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse eight, the apostle Paul writes, therefore let us be grateful. Now this is important because gratitude is also a central part of worship. We worship the Lord, we love the Lord, we serve him, we praise him because he is good, because he is a provider, because he is faithful. And so Hebrews 12, 8 says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Acceptable worship. Do we think about that enough? Or do we sometimes just see worship as coming in and punching the clock? And when we're finished, we punch it and we leave without being transformed, without having really experienced the gratitude and appreciation for who God is and what he has done. And in Hebrews, Paul even tells us that toward the end of time, men will be so obsessed and preoccupied with looking at the things coming upon the earth that they will neglect to come together. And so he says that we should not neglect to meet together, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together as the habit of some is, as the manner of some is, but we should encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching, the day drawing near. And he's talking about that great day of the Lord, Yom Yahweh, that the prophets have spoken about since the beginning of time, brothers and sisters. And so as we think about worship, we need to understand that worship is for good times and brothers and sisters, worship is for bad times. Even in the worst of times, even in affliction, even in sickness, we need to worship God. And that's clear when we look at the book that really focuses on the issues of suffering and really it leaves us to understand that we're not going to understand this here and now, but we can still know that even in the midst of suffering, God is good. In Job chapter one, verses 20 and 21, after Job, the man who was upright, the man who was perfect, the man who uh, served God faithfully and worshiped God faithfully, after he had lost everything, and then after his children were even lost, the scripture tells us that what Job did was that he got up and he worshiped. The word of God says, at this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. And then he fell to the ground in worship and he proclaimed, he said, naked came I from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be Praise. Brothers and sisters, in spite of what many, many prosperity preachers are teaching today, 
there's going to be affliction and trial in the life of the faithful, in the life of those who truly worship God. And that is going to be part of the test of our time. In the midst of trouble, will God's people continue to worship and to praise him? And time and again in the scripture, God has given us examples of those people who realize, as Jesus taught, that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And some people seem to think that to worship God in spirit means to worship God in a lot of noise. Don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters. We ought to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We ought to bless the name of the Lord. The scripture says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. But it's not that that really is the clearest manifestation of the spirit. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, brothers and sisters, there is liberty, there is joy, there is peace, and there is power. There is strength, brothers and sisters. The scripture has declared, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so where the spirit of the Lord is, there will be courage. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there will be compassion. We recognize that the greatest act of worship is the love that we show God, and that must be connected to the love that we show others. We can't profess, profess to, be, to love God whom we have not seen, the invisible, immortal, all-wise God, and not love our brothers and sisters who are all around us, brothers and sisters. And so in a sense, our worship testifies either for us or against us. The scriptures plainly said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, not everybody that gets their shout on, but he says, he that does the will of the Father. And so in John chapter four, again, a very important pivotal chapter on worship, when Jesus encountered the Samaritan woman, I want you to notice it. He didn't encounter the Adventist woman. He encountered the Samaritan woman. You know, sometimes we think that the people who are associated with great privilege are, are the people who uh, know all the ins and outs of worship. But this woman had a deep conversation with Christ. And uh, Jesus told her, and he's speaking to us today, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In other words, yes, there'll be rejoicing in the spirit, but there'll be power in the spirit. There'll be power in the spirit because when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide us into all truth. And so it is uh, not really consistent for us to uh, praise the Lord, to shout and to sing and, and, and to proclaim hallelujah if we're not also letting the spirit of truth guide us through the truth, which is the word of God. And when we do that, we will find that we find new things to shout hallelujah about, new things to rejoice about. And when Jesus said this to the Samaritan woman, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He went on to say, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. For the Father's drawing such people to himself. The Bible even tells us we could not even come except he draw us. And so from the beginning, worship has been at the center of what God wants to do for his people and what he wants his people to respond the way he wants them to respond to him with worship with gratitude with a faith that produces obedience through a love that works brothers and sisters god brought israel out of egypt so that they could serve him so that they could worship him and then worship is a universal experience. Everybody worships something and unfortunately are someone. And the whole point is that worship belongs to God alone. And if Satan cannot get us outright to uh, worship him, he will get us to worship other things, but any way he can to try to get the glory from God. In Isaiah chapter 25. Turn there with me. 
if you have your Bibles. Isaiah and chapter 25, the Bible says, O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. And here, what the prophet is saying is that first of all, the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, the covenant, the creator God, uh, the sovereign Lord, the only true God is my God. Is he your God today? Do you know him as your God? It's our privilege to know him as our God and as our father. And, he's, and then he goes on to say, the prophet, I will exalt thee. Remind you of what uh, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And why was it in David's mouth? It was in David's mouth because that gratitude and love and praise was in his heart. And brothers and sisters, when it's in our heart, it's going to flow out to others. You can't keep it to yourself. God's love is not designed to just be contained within your heart and your mind and your experience. God wants it, wants it to flow forth as living waters wherever you may go. And then he goes on. He says, uh, I will praise thy name for thou hast done wonderful things. Reminds us of that song that he has done marvelous things. And we can just time and again share our testimonies of how good he has been. We can search through the scriptures. We can search through history and see how good he has been, brothers and sisters. And then he goes on, he says, uh, thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. And what this simply means is that the things that you have said from olden times, from past, that you would do, truly you have done them. You have been faithful to your word and your word has proven to be true. And then in verse two, it says, for thou hast made of a city and heap of a defense city, a ruin, a place of strangers to be no city, it shall never be built. This is speaking of what God would do to Babylon. And indeed he did it. And in spite of the fact that after it was destroyed, that great city, that uh, time and again, other rulers would seek to rebuild it. And even most recently, Saddam Hussein would begin to rebuild it. But God said it would never be built, and it still to this day has never been built. Verse 3, therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee, for thou hast been a strength to the poor. Now here where it talks in verse 3, the strong people shall glorify thee. Who are the strong people? Daniel tells us, he says, the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And brothers and sisters, it's time for the church to be strong. It's not time for us to continue to be weak and vacillating and doubtful and anxious and uncertain. We must quit operating out of our own strength and our own knowledge. And we need to operate out of the power that God has given us through the Holy Spirit, out of the promises of God, believing his word. Verse four, Thou hast been a strength to the poor. Can you testify to that? A strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. And so here he's simply testifying to how great God is. Brothers and sisters worship. And we come together and we share the songs of old and we hear new testimonies and the new songs that God has put in our mouths. We remember how faithful he has been when we have been uh, even in bondage. I'm thinking about Israel down in Egypt. I'm thinking about Israel down in Babylon. I'm thinking about uh, the descendants of uh, African peoples in the diaspora. In, uh, in, in, in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, as well as in uh, the United States and in other places that these people have been dispersed. Uh, in Psalm 137, 
uh, the psalmist wrote, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Here we were, we were captive. We were prisoners, we were slaves, we were humiliated people. And we sat down in this new land to us by the rivers. And the Bible says, we wept when we remembered. You know, it's a shame that so often we don't appreciate things until we don't have them anymore. And so it was with Israel. It took captivity for them to appreciate what they had in the Lord. And then the psalmist goes on. He says, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? You know, it's interesting, though, that sometimes it's not until we are in a strange land, a difficult situation, affliction, that we really learn how to sing the Lord's song. I think about uh, the song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Lead me on, let me stand. That's a song that came out of great affliction as Thomas Dorsey had lost his wife and had lost his newborn child. It was not a song that, that, that came in good times, but it came in great pain and great sorrow. And so the question again, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I don't really know what the answer to that question is, but I do know this, we must sing the Lord's song in a strange land. We must sing the Lord's song wherever we are. And so brothers and sisters, when finally they came out of uh, bondage, came out of captivity in Babylon, the first thing that they sought to do, God raised up prophetic men, prophetic leaders. He raised up strong women. He raised up youth that would support what needed to be done. And brothers and sisters, as they came together as a people, supporting one another and the great project before them, the temple was rebuilt. Ezra, after 70 years of exile, the people rallied together to rebuild the temple under Ezra and to rebuild the walls about Jerusalem under Nehemiah. And the reason was so that the temple could be restored and worship could be restored, brothers and sisters, because worship is central to the people of God. As I said, we must worship in good times. We must worship in bad times. Worship is the breath of the soul, brothers and sisters. It is what keeps us strong in the Lord. And Habakkuk understood this in a time of great difficulties. Habakkuk would say, though the fig tree does not bud, and though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Boy, that, that's echoes of what uh, Job was like. Yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Sounds like the Apostle Paul who said, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but dumb, but refuse, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness, which is by faith. And so in worship, we learn what is most important to know him whom to know is eternal life and we can suffer the loss of all things and we still have all the treasures of heaven in him and that's what worship is about that's why the lamb is worthy that's why he's worthy of our praise that's why he deserves it brothers and sisters the psalmist said at psalm 95 and verse 6 he says, oh, come. I like that, brothers and sisters. We need to do this more. When we get ready to worship, we need to say to others, come and let people experience what we experience, the season of refreshing, the season of encouragement. Psalm 95, verse 6, and uh, the psalmist says, oh, come and let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. 
You know, you can't keep it to yourselves, brothers and sisters. We need to share the joy of worship. We need to share the healing power of worship in the presence of our God, the God of the universe. And the scripture goes in uh, Psalm 105, verse 1, it says, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. This is from the Psalms, and this is back in Psalm 105, long before Jesus actually came in the flesh. And we read about him in the Gospels. And we know that when Jesus left, he told his disciples, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Amen. Teach them about what? What God has done. This is just what Jesus told them was the same thing that was uh, throughout the Old Testament. We see an example here at Psalm 105 and verse 1. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Amen. Tell it to every kindred and nation. Tell it far and near. And then we go to Revelation. And Revelation is a book that is all about worship, brothers and sisters. In fact, it's about the crisis in worship. We began in Revelation 14, verse 6. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. But brothers and sisters, as we read throughout the book of Revelation, we see that there's a power that's arisen that is trying to claim the worship of God. In Revelation chapter 13, it says, um, verse 5, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All uh, nations shall worship who? Uh, the dragon and the beast to whom the dragon gives his power and the image to the beast. And those that worship the image to the beast will receive the mark of the beast. This is the climax of the controversy over worship, brothers and sisters. And the book of Revelation reveals from the first chapter to the last, the one alone who is worthy of our worship in Revelation chapter five. In Revelation chapter five at uh, verse four, uh, John the apostle looking into heaven through a door that's open. He heard a strong angel proclaiming who is worthy uh, to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And he found out there was no man, no man, no prophet could do it. No king could do it. No scientist could do it. No professor, no doctor, no, none of the great men, the great businessmen of the earth, nobody could do it. Nobody but Jesus. And he says that, uh, verse three, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And he said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to even look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not, don't cry, John, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. He said, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came, this lion, who is also a lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who's also the offspring of David. He comes, and in verse seven, he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Praise God. And when he had taken, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of odors, scents, and fragrances, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Do you see what he has done? The acts of God are really the focus of our worship 
They are the reason that we praise him. This is why our testimony is so important to tell others what God has done because that is why we worship him because he has done great things. He continually does great things, brothers and sisters. And he goes on, he gave them a new song. And they say, thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. Why is he worthy? Worthy, For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God. He's redeemed me to God. He's redeemed you to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. And this is the message about worship that the three angels take to the world, that we are to take to the world, that Christ has redeemed the world. He has redeemed every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and whosoever will let him come. And verse 10, not only has he redeemed us, but he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Brothers and sisters, he has given us what people fight and kill to get on this earth. And they fight and kill to get it for just a short temporal time. They fight great wars to be kings. They fight great wars to reign and to rule. But brothers and sisters, God's people who have humbled themselves, who have bowed their knee and worship to the lamb will be given what the great men what, what, what the rulers, the, the dictators, and the, uh, the, the, the heathen have long tried to get through power and through force is given to God's people because of their love for what he has done through Christ Jesus. He has redeemed us. Brothers and sisters, how great it is. When we talk of worship, there's so many instances of worship. We can think of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Think of how Israel had strayed so far, worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth during the time of King Ahab and Jezebel, and how Elijah had that showdown on Mount Carmel, which was all about worship. If the Lord be God, serve him. If he's not God, then get over here with the 850 prophets and, and, and worship Baal. Elijah, given the power of the Holy Spirit, stood to declare and to demand true worship, brothers and sisters. And Lord, we can think about, we, we can think about the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and, and think about them when, when it came time to bow down to the golden image. They were a witness to the world. And they said, the God we serve is able, but we will not bow down. And that's the question that's going to come before us when, when, when this country turns and tries to implement a form of worship, telling people that we want you to worship only on that first day of the week. That should be your central day of worship and not that seventh day, not that Sabbath of the Lord, uh, our God. And brothers and sisters, it will be a decision, but by then the three angels' messages will have gone out to the world by the grace of God, brothers and sisters, in the same way that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the three angels of their time. They were the three messengers who proclaimed that it was better to fear God and worship him and suffer and if need be die than it was to bow down to false gods and false images. And so we worship him because he is God, because he is sovereign, because he has redeemed us, brothers and sisters. And through Christ, he has given us every spiritual blessing that we need. And this is why we bow before him in worship, knowing that God has exalted him, Christ Jesus, and given him the highest place and given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow, every knee in heaven, every knee in earth, every knee under the earth, and every tongue shall proclaim, shall declare that Jesus is Lord. And you know, it's gonna happen one way or another. Praise God, we can do it now, because one day 
those that have rebelled, those that have resisted, those that have refused to worship God and to accept Christ, even they will bow on their knees and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the only true King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. And Christ has manifested to us the invisible God, the invisible Father. And so, as Paul says in the book of Romans, I appeal to you today, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, your bodies, as a living sacrifice. Christ has died for us. Now he's asking us to present ourselves, to surrender our will, our homage, our adoration, our love. So present ourselves, our bodies as living sacrifices, as temples of God, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service, which is our spiritual worship. That's what it is because the only way to truly give glory to God is not so much to shout it, even though we need to shout glory, glory, hallelujah, but the way to give glory to God is to let him abide in us. You remember when the temple was finished in uh, Exodus uh, chapter 40, and the temple was finished and it was anointed with oil and with blood and and, uh, and, and the priests were washed and they were clothed in the white garments, that finally when the temple was finished and it was dedicated, that the glory of God filled the temple. And that's what God wants to do. That's how we give glory to him. We give place to his glory, feeling us, filling us brothers and sisters, that it may be the light he wants to shine to the world. You know, the song says, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And brothers and sisters, we praise God for every light, no matter how bright, no matter how big, no matter how small. But we are dealing with demons. We are in the, in, in the last age of this earth when uh, we are told the spirit of prophecy that uh, demons will, will, will fill the hearts of human beings. Brothers and sisters, I read a story this week in the news. I will not even repeat it because it was so horrific, it was so demonic, and that's what we're dealing with. And brothers and sisters, it's not a little light of mine that's going to break through the darkness that is covering this earth right now. It's that fourth angel, like the one that joined Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were the three angels in the fiery furnace. They needed the fourth angel, and that fourth angel that came down, when Nebuchadnezzar saw it, he said he saw one like the Son of God. And that's the angel that needs to join us now. It's the presence of Christ through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Revelation 18, 1. I quote that text so much, some of y'all may be tired of hearing it, but I'm going to quote it one more time. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, great authority, and the earth was lightened with his glory, brothers and sisters. This is not a little light of mine. This is the light of Christ Jesus, who is the light of the world that he wants to fill you with and fill me with so that demons will tremble in your presence because they see Christ in you. We are in the last days. We are soon to encounter the last movements. We're told they will be rapid ones, brothers and sisters. And so we need to prepare to meet our God. Let's get our lives straight. Let's be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Let's confess our sins and our faults. Let's be there for one another to encourage one another in the Lord that God's grace is sufficient, brothers and sisters, because very soon the seventh angel will sound his trumpet. And when he does, there will be voices in heaven rejoicing, and they will say the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And brothers and sisters, at that time, I want to be there. When the 24 elders who sit on their thrones fall on their faces and worship him, saying, we give thee thanks, Lord God Almighty, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power 
and has reigned. Praise God. Let's look forward to that day. Let us pray. Loving God, our Father, what a work you have given us to do. We read so often about those Hebrew boys, as we call them, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, called by the Babylonian king Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were the three angels of their day, preaching to Babylon by their lives that it was better to serve the living God, even if you died, than to bow down to graven images. And Lord, when they bore their testimony of the three angels' messages, when it looked as though they were going to be consumed by a hot fiery furnace that was heated seven times hotter than it should have been, uh, when they were thrown into the fire, uh, they were not even touched by the flames. Uh, they were not, they didn't even feel the heat. Uh, the men that threw them in there were killed by the heat. And the king looked in and he saw one like the son of man, the son of God, walking with them in the furnace. And that's our prayer today. I want Jesus to walk with me in my trials. Lord, walk with me. And I want him to walk with you too. What a mighty God we serve. He deserves our praise. He deserves our thanksgiving. He deserves our love. And he deserves us to let others know how great he is. Bless everyone. Let your healing hand be upon everyone. Let your joy and peace be upon everyone. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. That will be our benediction for today. And we're going to go to our final selection for the day, our parting music. We're going to go down to Atlanta, Georgia, and we're going to hear from the Morehouse Glee Club, College Glee Club, singing for us a song we are all very familiar with because only those who overcome will sit with Christ on his throne. Only those who overcome will be given that new name. Only those who overcome will see his face. God bless you and stay strong in the Lord.